Hi everyone, this is Stephanie from Vegan Mainstream here and I am excited today because we're going to have an amazing interview with Ellen Jaffe Jones, the author of Kitchen Divided. We've been posting a little bit for the last couple of days, getting you guys excited and hopefully engaged in this conversation because I know many of us are living in semi-vegan households. And I think tonight's a really good opportunity to not only ask Ellen questions, but also I get to ask her some questions about not only the book and maybe some of her advice. So I'm hoping tonight is a great way for you guys, um, maybe those who are moving into veganism and starting to introduce it to your family and maybe the best way to kind of approach it, um, but also maybe people who've been coping and dealing with um, this kind of scenario of having a divided kitchen and what we'd love to do is maybe give some advice of um, you know what Ellen has experienced in talking with other people going around the country and obviously talking and speaking and doing all these amazing things she's been doing for the vegan community. She might be a great resource for you um, no matter what stage you're in. So before we dive into the book, I wanted to just take a minute to introduce Ellen Jaffe Jones in case you guys haven't heard about her. Um, Ellen's been doing an amazing job. Kitchen Divided is actually her second book. I'm actually going to pull up her book, Kitchen Divided, here so you guys can see it just in case. If you haven't seen the cool, amazing cover. But um, Ellen also did a book called Eat Vegan for $4 a Day, which is a smashing success, um, not only in the vegan world, but really outside of the vegan world as well. So we're excited to have her here, not only as an author, but also um, Ellen has an amazing background as a personal trainer. And also I'll let her talk a little bit about her former life in um, television as well and, you know, and all that good stuff. So maybe, Ellen, this is a good time for me to hand it over to you so you can give our audience kind of a good background of your experience, your expertise, and just why we all love you so much. Oh, you're so sweet. Thank you so much. Stephanie, that's just the nicest thing anybody said all day long. And we've been seeing a lot of incredible feedback on the various Facebook pages, so um, consider that an incredible compliment because uh, it is an honor to be here. My background was uh, 18 years in television news, uh, two Emmys and the National Press Club Award, and finding out the truth about food has become the investigative reporting job of my life. Uh, I'm not in this to sell any gadget or device, but um, it, for most of us, it is what's in it for us. And for me, it was my mom, aunt, both sisters who had breast cancer and uh, all of the other diseases of affluence, heart disease, diabetes, Alzheimer's, uh, almost all of them had that too. And my aunt died of cancer in our home when I was five years old, so that was very traumatic and set in motion this whole life of trying to figure out how do I avoid this mess? Because as the youngest in my family, my sisters are 9 and 11 years older than me, and um, I have three daughters, and we were part of the original breast cancer gene studies, so I didn't want this for my children. And this work really is about my legacy to not only my kids, but just to try and make the world a better place. I mean, that's that's really what uh, all of us are trying to do, and any time you can save an animal, whether it's human or not, is, is a good thing. Um, in my work in television, I found that uh, newsrooms, news management in particular, didn't take the whole animal rights uh, thing seriously at all. So all of my television life, I was thinking, well, I believe this is really important. I started getting involved in animal rights, picketing the Ringling Circuses when it came to St. Louis uh, to do their shows, and this really set in, in motion my own development. And I also, as a reporter, covered some of the worst animal abuse stories of the time. The puppy mills in Missouri, where I was a reporter, uh, I mean, I, you know, just all kinds of awful things. So. That set in motion that part for me, but I heard Dr. Neil Barnard speak in St. Louis for an animal rights event, and he was so mesmerizing, I thought, and I was still in television at that point, I thought, wow, wouldn't it be cool to actually just go park at his doorstep and go work for him, and sure enough, that's exactly what I did. I eventually left television, became a media trainer with my husband, who had already been doing that, and I said, honey, we got to ask these folks if they need any media training, and of course, Dr. Barnard is completely eloquent all on his own, so... Um, we, uh, he actually said, I'd love to do some media training for our staff. So went up there, smelled my way into their kitchen, became a, a cancer project cooking instructor, and then um, all of these ideas for books just started bursting in my head. 
And as far as Kitchen Divided goes, I got the idea to write that when I was traveling around the country talking about Eat Vegan on $4 a day. And I just, I've written in Eat Vegan, it's more important to have somebody who loves you than a clone at the dinner table. And when I would say this in my talks, I just, as an aside one time, go, so how many of you live in mixed, mess, uh, mixed marriages? Raise your hand. And it's like the whole audience is raising their hands. And I'm going, holy guacamole, there must be uh, another book in this. And then I started asking on Facebook, how many of you are dealing with this? And I just, uh, I went to my publisher and I said, can we do this? And they said, yeah. So that's it. I think it makes sense. I think a lot of people are dealing with this because for a lot of people, they're discovering veganism, you know, later in their lives. So this is maybe after you've been married for a little while, maybe you've been dating and so forth. So this is something that is kind of a lifestyle change that many people aren't born vegan. Now we're seeing more and more these days. So because of that, you know, we're trying to figure out how do we navigate it with our partners, our spouses, you know, our boyfriends and all that good stuff. So I think you're absolutely right. There's um, so much need for this topic and this discussion because, you know, we want to do something great by going vegan, um, but at the same time, we want to keep these relationships intact, you know, and keep... Right. And, you know, uh, a number of people have posted not only on Facebook now, but in the past, oh, I would never go out with somebody who wasn't vegan. And the reality is, in my cooking classes, almost everybody who was attending was attending by themselves they were not there with a partner sometimes they were or if they were I would always raise okay I would always ask the question ask people to raise their hands you know how many of you are here because you were forced to come here <laughs> and you know there were just you know a couple of men who would kind of go like that and, and I would say okay we'll try and make this painless for you but um, so many of us are becoming vegan in the course of a relationship and for those of us who do divorce just is not an option I mean yes it is the bottom line end of the road option but um, there are many ways that you can cope with the situation and not have to get to that point I believe yeah and I think that's important for people to kind of know because you know maybe not people are ready for that that other ultimate option but I think you know with anything in relationships and any type of change there's kind of a process and approach and you know sometimes if you approach something a little bit wrong you may not get that outcome so I think that's exciting about some of the topics and some of the things that we're going to be talking about tonight where we ask you you know kind of I'm going to begin to ask you and kind of dig into some of the best ways to approach it so that you know we kind of feel the transition because just because I decided to go vegan today may not mean my family is ready to go at that exact same moment. Um, so I think we need to all be a little bit respectful, but at the same time, figure out a way that we can help help everyone through it. Absolutely. Yeah. So I guess that kind of gives me a good little transition into our first question about the approach. So if someone is going vegan or thinking about going vegan or plant-based, what's the best way to approach it kind of with you know, spouse or boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever your kind of relationship situation is. Um, so you can kind of decide, you know, who's going to cook what and what's kind of the right flow. Well, I think you have to know your partner or your family, uh, whatever you think is going to be their biggest area of interest. You know, I chose my first book because I'm a big believer that if you show people how much money you save by going vegan, um, not only by the choices at the store, but how much money you can save and really crunching the numbers financially, uh, by avoiding that hundred thousand dollar bypass surgery no matter who pays for it those kinds of things can be very meaningful now for some people if they're facing a certain kind of medical condition like heart disease um, there's some great videos movies out there CNN's the last heart attack is a great one uh, that, that uh, kinda takes more mainstream issues you know a lot of people find that the, the friends and their family around them are going like, oh yeah, right, you know, what are you doing? This is, you know, they, they have just these preconceived ideas. So if you can show them some mainstream types of doctors like you find in the movie Forks Over Knives, and if you can get your partner or your family to sit down and watch one of those movies, then, you know, sometimes you can actually see the light go off and they go, wow, I never knew this or I never thought about that. And then you can talk about it with them and see if there is some kind of uh, 
interest or fire that lights under them that maybe you can branch off in, in that uh, down that road. For others it may be an actual animal rights uh, type of movie that gets them. Earthlings is one that's often mentioned that is a catalyst for a lot of couples or, or people. Um, uh, Farm Inc. is another one that's got, like when you, you start reconnecting with how that animal protein gets on your plate three times a day then all of a sudden you realize, wow, there is there is no animal in the animal kingdom that actually eats protein or animal meat three times a day, really. So why do humans need to do that? We don't. So those are the kinds of transition types of questions and movies that maybe can ignite that initial discussion. And then I also recommend just writing a list of what your priorities are. Um, because for a lot of people, as long as you know where the red line is and to know what it is you will do or you will not do, and as long as your family or your partner knows that, that really helps to identify what it is that you need to do together and how you function as a couple with these different and converging ideas. Now, do you feel these are more like ground rules, meaning this is how we're going to kind of agree, you know, we're we going to compromise or we're going to cook together um, and this should be kind of a conversation or do you really feel like these are like documented, let's get them down just to make sure we're all on the same page type of approach? What, what would you recommend? You know, everybody's different. If you've lived with somebody, whether it's your partner or your family for a while, maybe you can just sit down uh, some evening and go over this stuff. For other people, um, if you want to do like putting it in a formal list kind of thing, it's more helpful to do it for yourself. And you can rank what the priorities are. Like maybe um, one of the priorities might be, I never want to touch meat again. So how is that going to happen? Um, and that needs to be discussed with those around you if you don't want to do that. Because for some people it becomes a physical revulsion uh, and reaction and you have to deal with that. So. Um, those are the kinds of things that if you if you try talking about it and it gets to be too intense or or too much of a battle then maybe writing it down can be helpful and you can ask the other person or the other people in the family group um, you know let's maybe just have a little writing session here and work through this exercise so that we can then get back together and talk in a more rational maybe less emotional state so we can work this out together because the kitchen for a lot of people it's the source of so many good positive feelings but if you are bumping into each other with uh, somebody's got the meat and the other person doesn't you know you can it's it's also close quarters so you have to figure out how you not uh, get into a fight with each other yeah that's a good point because the kitchen can be a really nice social gathering area and you don't want to kind of turn it into that or create a ah. of, of you know, <laughs> tension around it. One thing I think might be interesting also to talk about is, and maybe consider, and you can tell me your thoughts on is ground rules for the holidays, especially since we're going into Thanksgiving and Christmas and Hanukkah and Kwanzaa and all that good stuff that's coming up. You know, what are some thoughts or what are your thoughts around kind of ground ruling there? Because it may not be that you can necessarily um, control maybe going to someone else's house, but how you're going to handle that if you're going to other family members or even vice versa. If members are coming to your house to celebrate the holidays, you know, how are you going to kind of handle that in the household? That things like that might be a, a juicy topic. Uh, what do you think? <laughs> sure, we'll plunge right in. I think the easiest thing about going elsewhere is just offering to bring something and even if they say, oh no, no, we got it under control, you bring the hummus. You bring something that you know you can eat. And I love, um, Dr. John McDougall once said in some video that I was watching, he says, even if you don't eat for four to six hours, you're not going to starve to death. <laughs> and, and I've always remembered that, that uh, no matter how awful it is, whether it's a restaurant or somebody's house where you're going, um, that you know, you're not going to starve. And I make sure, I always have like a, a pot of beans and rice or something in the fridge that I can throw together at the last minute as I'm running out the door so that if I know that the, the pickings are slim, that uh, I have a somewhat full stomach so I won't, uh, it won't even be an issue for me. But um, you know, in my family of origin, again, there's a great age disparity and uh, without going there too much, um, I was doing this about 32 years ago when I first started going off the deep end, as they said, and you know, the whole thing of being a, 
just a, a black sheep and cult member. Those are the kinds of labels that uh, many of us experience uh, sometimes in places where uh, in families that are not supportive. So I was always the designated salad bringer. <laughs> <laughs> and so the repertoire of salads that I have is very diverse and uh, I would always make sure that there were beans or some form of protein in the salad so that it was a complete meal for me and um, it, it really, you know, it actually over time they really did enjoy and look forward to the salads that I would bring because they knew that they weren't just the run-of-the-mill salad that they would get at somebody else's dinner or at a restaurant so uh, I had a lot of fun with it. And, That's pretty cool because uh, you turned it into an opportunity to kind of create like almost a signature, I don't want to say dish necessarily, but maybe a signature experience because you were bringing different salads and, and different, um, you know, um, different tastes and flavors, I, I assume. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, for different get-togethers at uh, my house, I like to especially wow the crowds with desserts and give them something like chocolate mousse, for example, that they would never believe is vegan. And so if you do those stealth kinds of dishes, that is one way, whether it's, it's uh, the company that you have or your spouse or partners or people that you live with, it's always fun to do those kinds of, of uh, dishes, especially um, I have a chocolate surprise cake that uh, when I do presentations, I always show people a picture of the finished product and I go, guess what's in it? And they never guess that there are beets and pineapple and carrots and zucchini and uh, you know that the every time I make that and serve it it's like people are going really <laughs> it's just this kind of shock as they realize that uh, vegan food can taste very delicious yeah that is that's absolutely probably one of the most amazing selling cards about veganism is the food um, I mean, we all know veganism is larger than just the food and, um, you know, there's much more to it in the lifestyle, but being able to present the food and especially in tasty treats and desserts and savory dishes, it's such a great way to kind of get people to experiment, try and kind of tiptoe their way into it. So, um, so I love, love, love that you're saying that. But while we're on the holidays, which also works, I think, in the household is, you know, how do you kind of keep your cool and keep everybody cool? at the table when the discussion comes up? Because I know sometimes at the holidays, you know, that uncle, that niece, that person might be just waiting to ask you that question. Um, or vice versa, maybe in the household, if you guys are, you know, having some trouble transitioning, it can it can turn into a, a quick fiery discussion. So I don't know if you have any suggestions on that. Well, I tell you one of the greatest lines of all time, and uh, I'll just share it with you eventually after I get through this story, but uh, my, my husband developed uh, an allergy, believe it or not, to alcohol. And so every restaurant you go to, the first thing, you know, they're always so eager because, you know, the, the waiters and the, the waitresses are going to make a much better tip if they can serve you alcohol. And they come rushing up to the table with this great smile, you know, and they start saying it's happy hour and list all the drinks you can get. And so, you know, we, we try and be polite but say we can't drink for medical reasons. And so that is such a great line if you want to use that, oh, I, I eat plant-based for medical reasons or um, to save animals. I mean, you just have to develop these one-liners, whatever they are, and just zing it there. And it kind of, once you say it, if they want to continue the discussion, the other people who are around you, great. It's it's a, it's a engaging opportunity, if you like. Or if you just sort of hear this pall of silence, you can just change the topic and move on and if they want to get back into the topic later. You know, a family get together, it shouldn't be, uh, in, in theory, it should be a pleasant time and not one of fighting or uh, having words, especially around the holidays. And I think all of us have, um, if we are a part of a family, it's important to respect wherever people are. And I will tell you, I've had some people post on Facebook as recently as yesterday saying, well, you know, what is up with your family? How come they, uh, you know, knowing my, my family history, this one poster said, you know, how come everybody in your family isn't doing what you're doing? And I do get that question quite a bit. And my answer to that is sometimes, you know, that whole thing of you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. And you just have to set the example. Now, what is interesting is that I have uh, two cousins who have gone vegan. I know one of them went vegan as a result of staying with me for four days. And I was not trying to sell anything, but she just saw 
the transition. And the interesting thing is because we are about the same age, she had grown up with me, so she knew some of the medical problems not only I had, but my family had. And she goes, wow, if you can conquer all that just through diet and a little bit of exercise thrown in, then maybe this is something for me. And she transitioned and lost a lot of weight and is just a, a raving vegan now also. So, <laughs> you know, these kinds of changes happen. I hate to set the, or say the trite example of, uh, uh, the phrase, but just leading by example, that's what you have to do and do it in a peaceful, calm huh, way and you know, easier said than done for many of us because we get so emotionally charged with all of these different issues, saving animals, understanding what happens to animals. Once you've seen one of these videos, it's hard to get those images out of your mind. And so I know we all have to deal with that, but it's important to understand that many people now are really looking at eating vegan not only as a way to improve their health but they're seeing a lot of these movies and they understand that maybe even just cutting out meat a few times a week would be a good thing and I think a lot of people are also understanding the environmental connection and that you know if we want our kids to be able our grandkids to be able to see fish in the oceans and and uh, appreciate nature for what it is we have to make some pretty serious changes now. Yeah, absolutely. And we had a great comment that just came through about how amazing food choices can be very intimidating to others, especially our families. And I think that is such the perfect comment because it really is true. And sometimes you're not even aware of it until you became vegan or plant-based. You know, when it, it's almost like you didn't realize that it was such a, um, you know, powder keg for some people. Um, so I think, uh, Madison, thanks so much for that comment because I definitely agree that that is the case. I don't know what your thoughts are, Ellen. Well, my thoughts are, let's see if I can switch this. Um, so I wear this shirt all the time. <laughs> and I went to an animal rights conference where I was actually a speaker. And one of the organizers was talking about wearing a shirt because it always engages people. Now, there are some shirts that are nicer than others or uh, less confrontational than others. And some, if you go to any of these veg fests, like there's one coming up in Tampa on Saturday, and they have a lot of vendors that sell these shirts that are really in-your-face kinds of things. So you have to see how much you can push the envelope and uh, what's right for your situation. You know, if you have family members with a good sense of humor, you could probably wear some of these shirts. But if you think it will ignite the powder keg, then wearing a very um, non-threatening but just uh, simple kind of shirt that might draw some attention or some engagement. I always look at wearing shirts like this as the potential for engagement because people come up to me, I do a lot of running and racing and people come up to me all the time as I'm holding an age group award medal saying, oh you can't race or run on a vegan diet and I instead of getting you know frumpy about it or anything I'll just go well actually I've been doing it for about 30 years and then the conversation starts so just sort of throwing that one liner out there to get the conversation going or not you have to be the best judge of where to take it and how much to kind of come out of the closet about it absolutely we have another question that came up um, it's a question about being kind of a single mom of three kids and her challenge is her ex and her parents are Omni. Um, <laughs> one of her children, her oldest, has decided to go veg. Um, and what she's really being struggled with, is struggling with, is kind of the pressure from the family. Whether it's, you know, boys need meat. Um, whether it's, you know, maybe not showing the respect for um, establishing the lifestyle, even for maybe um, the oldest that actually decided to go veg. So I don't know if you have any advice for her on how she can kind of navigate that in her family. Sorry, I had to throw you a tough one. Um, oh no, this is like right up the alley. Um, because food for kids, I have three kids who are in college and beyond now, so we've gone through all of that obviously, but um, my experience not only with them but in teaching cooking classes and, and talking to people for years is that food is, it can be a battleground in relationships and certainly in a divorce situation it can just sort of become the focus of other, what, what's really a disguise for other issues and, and you have to be a good judge of 
what that really is. Now, if there's certain medical concerns, like, you know, is, or is, is the child getting enough protein? Um, you know, you can always do the flex the arm. Does it look like I have a protein deficiency kind of thing? Or, you know, there are ways to deal with that that, again, are not so much um, in your face as much as they are just factual. But just trying to deal with each issue as it comes up in a calm way is really uh, key and identifying what the real concern is and a lot of times again it's just developing those one-liners like um, the American Dietetic Association says a vegan diet is appropriate for all ages of life including, including pregnancy and breastfeeding so knowing those kinds of I call them comebacks or one-liners can be helpful and again saying it in a very non-judgmental but just factual way and um, and then if you are depending how amicable the relationships are sending emails with links to the research there's some great sites that can provide this kind of research that is very mainstream and you can certainly offer that as a way of supporting the lifestyle uh, and the eating choices um, you can point out to the many incredible vegan athlete books that are out there um, by, by people like Rich Roll, um, Brendan Brazier, you know, those kinds of folks who have really excelled in their sport and have written the books to um, talk about how they've done it and how many athletes. I like to say one of my favorite quotes now is plants enhance, they enhance athletic performance. And they don't make you a weakling and uh, across all different sports now we're seeing a lot of uh, athletes adopt a vegan diet. Why? Because it helps with um, dealing with recovery and reducing inflammation. And the the protein is often more bioavailable and absorbable. So you need protein for muscle recovery, and that's why you're seeing all these incredible vegan bodybuilding competitions that are being won by um, the vegans. So it's it's really quite amazing to see what's happening in the whole sports. Uh, area, if that is an area of concern, and a lot of kids relate to that. Yeah, absolutely, because the whole strength in athletes, and especially, you know, sometimes the traditional sense of, you know, boys need protein, I think sometimes that comes from that, you know, that athletic um, position or the position of strength, so I think that's a good, really great recommendation. Right. And, you know, these veg fests are happening all over the country in the largest cities, so if you can take either uh, your child, your children, or any concerned relatives to these events and you know you can really bribe them to get them there because all the food vendors are there with yes some of the faux meats and that's another way to get people interested who are in your family or your, your circle of friends who are not eating the way you are I'm not suggesting a steady diet of faux meats but there are just some amazing products out there right now uh, one of my recipes in Kitchen Divided has uh, some faux shrimp and um, you know I wouldn't eat a steady diet of that but you mix it in with the other ingredients and it tastes just like ceviche and so if you have these people who are addicted to those kinds of uh, you know whether it's steak or hamburger or those kinds of things you can find the faux products just to help in the transition to get them there if they don't want to just all of a sudden give up their McDonald's and go total plant-based in its natural state you know that happens for some people but for some people they go no nah. I need to do this gradually. So you got to find out whatever works. Okay. And then, I mean, while we're kind of on the subject of food and maybe even as we talk about your book, you know, what are some of the recipes that people should consider or think about if they're trying to create those like flexible items or those items that are kind of going to work for all the palates that are maybe in the household? Yeah, well, the idea is not to feel like a short order cook. And if I had to pick one complaint that people who live in a in a mixed marriage or a divided kitchen feel it is that that they're doing all these different recipes so you have to and this, the way that my book is organized is um, is is by recipes that you can or the meat eater can dump whatever they want to dump into it or onto it or next to it so that you don't have to cook something separately if you don't want to and if you are comfortable in telling uh, the meat eaters, okay guys, you're on your own, 
you just go cook whatever, and this is what I'm making. If you want to add to it, great. And, you know, saying it, of course, in a very nice, polite way. But um, soups are a great way, and I have a lot of soups in the book that, again, you can just, they can do whatever they want to it, adulterated, whatever, however. But you have your main dish, and so you don't necessarily have to feel like that. I mean, that's, I really wanted to create recipes where uh, they could be totally standalone for you. And if you wanted to make another side dish, um, it's something. It would be something that they would like to as well. Or if they wanted to add other things to it, they could do that. But the idea is to take the pressure off whoever is doing all that meal prep to say, okay, this is what I'm willing to make. Because um, you know, as people, especially as they age, just the whole multitasking thing gets a little challenging, and. Uh, People feel like they want to, because they are so overwhelmed, they often will feel like, uh, oh, okay, I'll just eat a Amy's burrito, um, and that's going to be my meal while I make something for somebody else. And then their own health starts to suffer by not uh, keeping a wide and varied and healthy vegan diet. Yeah, I definitely could, could see that happening, especially when you're, you know, you're eating and trying to take care of everyone else. It's so easy, especially because you're taking care of the family. It's so easy to kind of neglect and maybe not get that balanced um, balanced meal. Now, what about when we're thinking about meals? Do you recommend people embrace or maybe stay away from some of the traditional comfort foods? I mean, you have these dishes like lasagna as an example. That's a very kind of traditional, you know, non-vegan dish, but you've seen a lot of people veganizing them as well. Do you think people should engage in those, or do you think? they should come up with things that maybe are a little bit more unique and a little bit different so they're not competing with that historical flavor in someone's in someone's um kind of you know everybody's different and there are, there are some great books out now that talk about the addictive powers of food and food manufacturers what they do uh, comparing them to cigarette companies by putting sweeteners and salt and fat uh, into food so that we keep coming back for more. And I was recently a, a chef at Dr. John McDougall's Advanced Study Weekend, and there was a speaker there that talked about how sugar is more, they've done MRIs now of the brain, and sugar is um, more addictive than cocaine, and it lights up parts of the brain that even cocaine does not. So when as we learn about all of this, it's very helpful to understand that it's not so much that you don't have willpower, but it is about the very addictive properties of some of these foods. So again, you have to decide what works best for you. You know, everybody has a sweet tooth. You don't lose that. Um, uh, you know, nature made sure that we uh, wanted to um, keep coming back for more breast milk from our mamas so our brains would grow bit really big, and that's why we have such a, a strong sweet tooth. And once you are weaned, in theory, uh, if you ever were doing that whole thing, you don't give up that sweet tooth, but it becomes the challenge for all of us of how do you satisfy it, which is why nature, in her infinite wisdom, invented fruits. So if you find the right substitutes for the chocolate chip cookies or the comfort foods that you have identified in your life, then it can be a more successful journey. But especially in divided kitchens with those chocolate chip cookies sitting in the other side of the pantry, even if you have a divided pantry, it is a tough struggle. And so um, you have to identify what those addictive foods are and, uh, if possible, keep them out of the house. That really is the best recommendation I've seen on dealing with these kinds of food addictions and, and feeling full. So getting back to your question of what are really comfort foods, everybody defines them differently, but historically we associate them with the grains, and grains are taking a bad rap these days, but um, you know, if you have not been diagnosed with a gluten deficiency or sensitivity, there's no reason to cut out uh, grains. If you have some concerns, by all means, check with your doctor, get it diagnosed or whatever. Uh, and even if you don't um, want to include some of the more offending grains, there are still tons of other grains out there that are not uh, uh, reactive and, and don't um, cause gluten problems. So um, explore that. I love millet. Millet is a great little grain that has been out there and just a little tiny bright yellow colored grain that looks like it has butter on it. So for people who have butter addictions, I really recommend millet. So there are all kinds of foods like that that can excite your sense of 
uh, comfort or uh, addiction, whatever it is, you just have to learn what those good substitutes are for you. Perfect. Now, when you started talking about grains, it got me thinking about setting up the pantry or setting up the kitchen. And there's probably a ton of different ways to set it up. But I don't know if you want to give our listeners, viewers, maybe a couple of options on what they can do if they're trying to kind of stock their kitchen, but at the same time, you know, keep the peace in, um, you know, in the inventory management <laughs> in the kitchen. Well, if you are lucky enough to be the main chef in the kitchen, then you get to set it up however you want. And uh, I think one of the biggest challenges in a divided kitchen is not eating the other stuff. So you get to put your stuff on the counter. So your counter should be all full of colorful grains and beans in the clear jars. So that's what you reach for first when you go to start making a meal. That that's what you see. And um, the pantry stuff should be stuff that uh, you know, out of sight, out of mind kind of thing. And in your pantry, um, you probably want to, if you can, actually physically divide it so that you don't have to look at the other stuff. Uh, I think that goes a long way in keeping the peace. And same thing with the refrigerator. You know, most refrigerators have a fruit and a vegetable bin, but there's nothing that says that you have to divide it that way. It can be your stuff in that one bin and nobody else touches it kind of thing. You just basically have to set territorial divides and marks so that um, everybody respects each other's territory, property, and also utensils too. You can certainly have the whole divided uh, kitchen with regards to what is served. You know, if the meat plates are in one cabinet and you know non-meat is somewhere else. Whatever works for you. And you have to again identify how far you want to go with those kinds of issues. Yeah, and I like the thing that you said about you know kind of keeping some of those things out of sight because I do think if you are transitioning or kind of new to being vegan you know, you want to kind of keep some of those foods that you're trying to avoid, you know, not so easy in reach. So even sometimes putting it on the top or on the higher shelf, you know, I'm five two, so the higher shelf deters me every time. Right. <laughs> so things like that, I think, um, I think that was really good, good advice there. Um, I guess that leads me into one other question. And I know this might be a touchy subject out there for everyone who's watching, but you know, cooking the meat, especially if you are the person who cooks for the family. And I know some of us, you know, everyone has a difference of opinion and how they approach it and so forth. So maybe if you could give us some ideas, I don't know if it's going to be kind of pros and cons or different ways people can approach it, um, depending on how they ethically or emotionally feel about it and also depending on, um, you know, their family circumstance. Yeah. Well, again, it depends. As I love to use that as an answer to things. It just depends. Um, what does it depend upon? Well, how far you want to push the envelope or how much you think you can get away with. Now, every time a new study comes out that's like one of my favorite ones in the last six months, I think, was that they found that there's more MRSA in uh, pork than they had originally thought they, whoever they are, um, you know, the kinds of studies that are, they're kind of scare studies I like to refer to them as, and I will uh, recommend that you read those to the people around you and maybe one will take hold, especially MRSA is a huge issue right now and a lot of people are being affected by that one way or another, so you know, if that kind of thing scares you or your family members, you might want to share that. So uh, as much as you can get into some of these issues in trying to set it up, uh, that is one way to try and structure how you deal with these very sensitive and difficult issues. And um, I'm really glad that the barbecue pit was invented because <laughs> if the weather's nice and with global warming, we may be able to barbecue in the middle of January most places. So for a good part of the year, you can send the meat cooking folks outside if that's uh, what they want to do, just to make sure that they have a nice... Uh, barbecue pit that is sheltered from the elements if possible and, and that's just one way that people can can deal with uh, having to cook the meat. Um, you know restaurants are certainly a way, it's interesting on Facebook today a lot of people said that they had difficulty with their uh, 
in their relationships at restaurants. I actually think that's a great way to deal with people being able to order whatever they want. And I think the struggle is mostly over which kind of restaurant they go to. But I find that any restaurant, even um, you know, a steak place, is going to have potatoes and side dishes. You just order the side dishes from the menu and you can be quite satisfied with, uh, again, until you get home, if you really feel like uh, it wasn't uh, enough for you. So there are different ways of dealing with this in terms in the of... restaurant side, what's been interesting for me and what I've experienced is a lot of times we... I'll struggle when I'm going to restaurants with people, not because they aren't able to order, but because of the amount of questions I have to ask when I order. <laughs> And I think I try to, and I don't know if this is a tip for anyone out there, I tend to take my waiter away from the table to sometimes have that discussion um, just because I think sometimes people either feel bad for the waiter or waitress because of the amount of questions or the, or the back and forth sometimes that happens. I don't know, Ellen, what's been your experience. Um, not even just that. It, like When I'm in large group or like events when I'm going out with a large group of non-vegans, a lot of times I will talk to the waiter or waitress right. away from the table just because it becomes, it can become a you know a big um, production sometimes at, 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 depending on the restaurant you're in. Right, or if the people around you have heard this discussion before, it's like oh you know there she goes again kind of thing. So I I, I feel your pain. Um, one of the things I learned by accident, uh, I was with a large group. Uh, we live somewhat close to Disney World, and uh, we went over there, and I just didn't want to put subject the whole table to the vegan discussion. So when uh, the waiter came around. I said, uh, "You know what? I'm allergic. I'm allergic to dairy, and I don't eat meat." And within about uh, 60 seconds, he was out with a clipboard, and I had to sign the the waiver on the clipboard that said that I understood that the food I would be eating was made in a facility or on equipment that came in contact with with uh, dairy and allergens. Mm. And I I thought that was so great that that's really what sent. Him, he, he understood that. I didn't have to go into the whole explanation of what eating vegan was or vegetarian and, you know, dis, uh, distinguishing um, uh, that whole thing. And, and just by saying, you know, I'm allergic to dairy and I don't eat meat, that conveyed the message very clearly to the point, and I, I just had to laugh that they came out with this waiver because that's really what it's all about. Why did they do that? Because they didn't want to get sued if I ate some of the allergy producing foods and then keeled over and then you know sued Disney for everything they're worth kind of thing so I thought that worked so well I have used that in other restaurant situations and it just again if you want to explain it great but if you want to just enjoy your dinner without going into lecture number 10 um, that's one way to do it absolutely I, I definitely agree with you I think that's another <laughs> way to to keep the conversation simple and, and quick and, and, and move on to the point the reason why you're at, at dinner or having a good time um, for dinner um, exactly. a, question, a question that come in um, that kind of relates to what you talked about a little bit earlier today, but I didn't know if you wanted to expand on it a little bit. But, you know, um, Jan is submit, submitting a question where she's saying even in her cooking classes, she gets a lot of questions or concerns about, you know, how to cook for the family and not feel like that short order cook. Um, I don't know if you want to expand on that. I know you touched on it a little bit more, but do you have any other recommendations on, on that? Well, the tip for shortcuts, uh, and there are lots of them, but the one that I like the most is just keeping that batch of beans and grains in the fridge at all times so that if you come into a situation, you come home at the end of the day and you've got to get the food on the table in a hurry, at least you can take care of yourself and you have some kind of staple that will tide you through uh, getting the other dishes on the table. And the idea is to keep it as simple as you can for yourself. You certainly can freeze foods, um, recipes that you, you make in excess so that if you don't feel like cooking something fresh for yourself or for the other people, you can just grab something out of the freezer. Um, you know, you really want to, because what happens if you do start feeling like the short order chef, then uh, short order cook, uh, you just feel like... Um, the resentment starts to build over time and if um, especially you're uncomfortable in expressing that then you do have to deal with that in some ways that are either going to change the situation 
or you just have to explode like a pressure cooker. And speaking of which, pressure cookers are great ways to cook beans very quickly, and they have some amazing pressure cookers now that have timers on them. The Instant Pot, the, if anybody has one of those, uh, those are very cool. It's like a pressure cooker. I mean, they want it to be your one-stop pot, and it does everything, and it has a timer on it, so you can set... Um, if you want to go off in the morning, you can set uh, whether it's one of these instant pots or a pressure cooker with a timer on it. It can be very helpful in organizing your day so that at least you can take care of yourself with the beans and the grains and then deal with the others uh, when you come home at the end of the day. And in terms of other shortcuts, you know, I know there's some controversy surrounding blenders and food processors these days that we ought to be using the original masticulators, the original blenders, our teeth to be chewing foods and even if you eat a blended drink you should be chewing it first so the saliva starts digesting it. Uh, you know, I think blenders are a great way to get uh, a fairly uh, balanced meal into you or whomever without stressing over doing a lot of food prep. So if it means that that's the way you're going to get your vegetables in you that day, then that has to be it. You just have to find ways that are going to work for your lifestyle. And um, there are many great books out there that help people uh, get a balanced, healthy, vegan diet. And there's really no excuse for us to sell ourselves short because if we don't, if we're not healthy eating a vegan diet, then we're not doing the cause any good. We have to be out there as good little representatives saying that this is what eating vegan can do for you. And if you have health issues, I mean we all do, but if you have them specifically because you're not eating a balanced and healthy diet, you're not doing the animals or the humans a good service. Yeah, I think that's a really good point to make. Um, because we forget how much we can be representatives in our, even in our own families, in our own little nucleus, or even in our neighborhood, or things like that. Because you know, once people kind of see you as the vegan, um, you know, you do kind of become the <laughs> the vegan. You do. <laughs> you know, and I mean, not maybe everyone wants to step up and be the spokesperson in a sense, but I think it is important to get people thinking about, you know, how you. Um, you know, do represent the community and what, what you do. Um, you know, people see and people watch um, and people sometimes emulate as well. So I think that's a, yeah. a really good point. The other thing I thought was interesting, you were talking about preparing foods, and we've had a lot of discussions um, on our cookbook club where we've been talking about preparing foods. And one thing that we've been learning and to do, and I've been kind of starting to do now, and I don't know if you do this as well, is, you know, I used to just make broths as an example. So it would just be basic cucumber, excuse me, um, celery, carrots, and, uh, and onions, you know. But what I've recently been doing, especially as I've been getting into this new cookbook that's been teaching me more about, like, Indian dishes because I really just love the spices, is I've been making these, like, um, they're almost like starter sauces. So they have a lot more flavor in them. So if I am going to do a soup, instead of it just starting with a bland kind of broth, I'll make an actual broth that really is kind of tasty. So when I'm making a soup, I can make it very fast because it's already almost pre-seasoned. And the same thing for Indian food, I'll have kind of this like sauce that maybe my spicy tomato, ginger, garlic mix, and so forth. And that's been a really kind of fun experience for me on, you know, speeding up the cooking time because I have those base kind of sauces and I can use them in different dishes. Have you been doing right. any of that yourself? Or? Yeah, you know, one of the, the tips that I offer is keeping the food processor right next to the sink, right out there, so that, um, you know, you're not going to be tempted to make junk and that there's no excuse. You can just throw the, the fresh vegetables in there, keep the blades very close by, um, anything that can help you get healthy food on the table in a hurry. Um, you can get the plastic or glass containers and process a lot of vegetables at once and have them in these containers right at eye level. So again, when you open the fridge with the light behind them, you're going to see these, this gorgeous array, the rainbow of colors greeting you at eye level, and that's what you reach for. So um, you know that's another way uh, to kind of expedite the, the food on the table in a hurry. You can have the burritos or the corn tortillas and just uh, load them up with all these fresh vegetables that you don't have to feel like um, you have to process them every single time you want some fresh vegetables. They'll last for three or four days before they start uh, getting cranky, and uh, you just put them in your salad or whatever you can do. That's it, the, the more you can do in advance, 
the faster you're going to get through whatever it is you have to do for the actual meal preparation. So um, sauces are a great way. Salad dressings, um, good to make those in advance as much as you can and you know, make them in large quantities if, as long as you're going to use it so you're not wasting it. Uh, is a way to just decorate, even if you only have time to get the romaine in a bowl. <laughs> yep. At least you've got your dressing, and hopefully there'll be some healthy ingredients in that as well. So, you know, you get uh, some access. Absolutely. That definitely works. So we had another question come up. Um, this is coming in from Sue, and Sue was saying that she's having her son coming home from the Army um, for Thanksgiving, um, and, um, you know, her husband and her younger daughter they want to have turkey for Thanksgiving. Um, and she's trying to figure out how to deal with this. So I don't know if you have any recommendations for her. And they know that she's vegan, do we know? I the kids... assume they do, um, just from the question. Um, Sue, if you want to just clarify that and you're watching, just let me know. Um, but I assume they do since they're asking specifically for a turkey. And you said son and daughter-in-law, so it's a married couple? Or no, is it just a son? Her son is coming home and um. Yeah. Um, my okay. husband and and younger daughter want turkey, so it looks like it's son, husband, and younger daughter. Okay. Does she have a mother-in-law? <laughs> <laughs> Send them there. Um. Okay. Well, I. It sounds like she's a rather new vegan, and this is the first time perhaps she's dealing with this situation. But she has uh, some older children. It sounds like, or you know, she's. Uh, a, a more recent, uh, it's not like she's raised the kids uh, in this situation. So, you know, I mean, I hate to say it, but Tofurky has a really good vegan turkey that she could prepare at least for herself and, um, you know, maybe just saying to them, well, how would you guys feel about uh, going out and getting your own turkey? I mean, there's so many places now that will prepare it for you so that you don't have to do it. And they're very delicious, I hear, from people who eat them. Um, so it's not only the grocery store and Whole Foods and places like that where they will, you know, you call them up a few days in advance to reserve it. So you don't have to even mess with it. So if that's something she's willing to do, that might be an option. And then she could prepare her own vegan Thanksgiving and expose all of them to what the options might be. Now, I said Tofurky because obviously that's why uh, that company has enjoyed such a um, great, uh, great profit margin because they found this kind of a, an audience that will, uh, and consumers who want this kind of a product. But there are some fabulous uh, vegan Thanksgiving options out there. I know that uh, PCRM, Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, every year features a whole slew of different vegan dishes that you can make. And for the longest time, I've been making vegan pumpkin pies and uh, sneaking a little black a black strap molasses in it for um, uh, the, the nutrient content of, um, of that. And, you know, you can do all kinds of things to sneak these little side dishes in that um, you can do a squash dish for Thanksgiving with uh, nuts and seeds on it and it just, you know, again, there are all kinds of re th vegan Thanksgiving recipes including squash as the main dish and all kinds of fun things that you can mix into it to make it very appealing. And then, you know, the other folks who are getting their turkey can eat that as a side dish. So I think she needs to be, if she can, be firm about where her priorities are and look at some of these other options and if she feels strongly enough she doesn't want it in the house, maybe say, okay guys, on this day we are not going to have meat in the house. You want to get turkey, you can go out for it the next day to a restaurant or wherever, uh, somebody else's house for leftovers, or maybe they get invited someplace else just for Thanksgiving and then she can bring her own thing and, and be happy. So there are different ways you can deal with it and as we get into the holidays you just have to tread lightly. Yeah, absolutely. And I really like a product from Field Roast. I don't know if you've ever tried theirs. Yeah. But those are good, especially if you're looking for like a centerpiece item. Um, and then I'm not really good at it yet. I don't know about you, Ellen, but I've been working on my gravy skills. And <laughs> <laughs> what I find is people like gravy because of the memory of it. So sometimes I, you know, work on those types of dishes because they give the emotional connection that people have to the dish. 
but obviously my grace is vegan. Um, so that's one thing I've been, like I said, been, I've been working on it. Maybe 2013 is the year for me to, to perfect it. Yeah, there are some delicious gravies, especially from mushrooms and any kind of vegetable broth that you can thicken. And uh, it doesn't take a whole lot of creativity to do that if you want to include them as part of your centerpiece meal. Absolutely. And then Dawn posted a, question, a comment here. Thanks, Dawn, where she did a suggestion of just saying that, you know, Dawn saying she makes all the sides and what she has her husband do is take responsibility for the turkey if he wants, which is great to what you were saying. So. Great. I think that was a great question. Well, we are at like 9.27 here. Oh, now, no. So we're getting close to wrapping it up. I'll look around and see if there are any other questions, but I didn't know if you had any like wrap-up thoughts or any kind of, um, you know, final advice for our listeners as they're watching today. Well, you know, my mama used to say patience is a virtue, and I can tell you it's not genetic <laughs> because, like, I want the whole world to go vegan like yesterday, but... That really is what we have to do. As, as we understand how we are so connected to animals in ways that we are just beginning to understand. And it's important that as energized and as passionate as you may be, that leading by quiet example may be the best approach. And uh, you may be surprised with all the comments I've seen on Facebook, and I hope it continues after this. You know, I'll be there the rest of, uh, through Wednesday of next week. I mean, I'll be there forever, of course. And I always tell people, if you buy my book, it comes with a lifetime access to me on Facebook. But uh, you know that I'm there, and uh, I'm always trying to engage um, our, our readers. And if you have any questions at all, I'm, I'm always there to try and help you through it. And sometimes it's just helpful to know that there is a huge network of people out there that can be supportive because if you try to do this alone sometimes I, I've seen the posts on Facebook just the last few days that people feel many of them feel like they're just really struggling with this and is it worth it I just feel so alone that's the kind of comment I'm seeing so just know that you are not and that um, you are leading by a great example perfect well thank you Ellen I think that was wonderful I think we answered all the questions out there um, and then also, I'm glad you mentioned our contest this week. I, we skipped right over that in the beginning. So I'm glad you're letting everyone know we will be talking all week long about advice and ways and tips. And we're going to have daily drawings. We're going to be giving away books and one-on-one -on -one sessions with Ellen. Um, so I think we really have a fun next kind of, I guess, six days ahead of us. Of um, Oh, and we're also going to have a recipe challenge. So on Saturday, guys. Um, you know, plan to go to the grocery store because we'd love to see you maybe make some of these dishes that are going to be great as well. So tune in on Ellen's Facebook page. Um, Ellen, do you want to give them both of your URLs for your Facebook page? Um, well, let's see. Eat vegan on $4 a day. Uh, so you can find me there. And then um, the Kitchen Divided page also has its own separate collection of people. <laughs> Perfect. So, so you can catch her on Facebook. Um, Ellen also is on Twitter. You just look up her name. You'll find her there. And then we'll also be posting on our page. You can obviously look up Vegan Mainstream. So we hope you'll participate and have fun this week. Um, we hope this session was exciting, um, helpful, and then also maybe took some of the stress out of the way you've been either feeling or concerns that you may have, especially as we go into the holiday season. And then as we chit-chat and talk um, throughout the week, on social media, feel free to post your questions, suggestions, ideas, or maybe anything that we didn't address tonight. We hopefully will address it over the next couple of days with you. So thanks everyone for joining. Once again, thanks Ellen for spending Thank you. time with me. Thank you, Stephanie. Time talking with you. And I guess we'll sign out for now. Bye. Bye thanks. Everyone.